wonderful first session of our six or 12 part <coughs> series for this year, depending on how you count it. Um, this is the flyer. Please look at it and mark all the dates down for the future. Tonight we're going to learn Sefer Amos, and we're going to Skype about it with the people in Rehobot on Sunday at 11 our time. Thank you very much, Rob, for agreeing to teach us. Um, a couple things to note. Rabbi Lau's lecture actually is up on the Rehovot Shul's website. Yeah, uh, those are skills beyond me. Well, they had 300 people. <laughs> no, no. Um, so tell your friends, because next time in December, I want to see 300 people here. All right. It, it will violate the fire code, but it's okay. All right. Are you ready? Have you been going all this time? Oh, I can't believe it. All right. Um, so thank you all uh, and Judy. Um, I wanted to do a couple things, and we'll have to sort of give me your feedback as we go. There are a couple of Tanakhim floating around. Um, but primarily what I wanted to do is kind of begin with sort of what is my outline for tonight uh, we're going to talk a little bit, very briefly, about the voice of Amos. Uh, and then we will talk a little bit about the structure of the Trasar, at least in a couple major points about how it comes to be and when it comes to be, and some of the historical setting that goes with it. Uh, and then we'll hopefully dive into the text tonight. Um, <clears throat> so in general, the term Trasar is actually a very old designation. The contents of the, uh, or the period that's sort of covered by the Treasar are probably about 300 or so years spanning up until the destruction of the first temple and go 300 years before that. So we're talking about 100 years into the period of kings uh, and recognize a couple other things in terms of um, there is a split between the northern and the southern kingdom that's going to be important. The northern kingdom is referred to as the kingdom of Israel. Uh, we will talk about a king, Jeroboam, uh, tonight, who is not the original Jeroboam who creates part of the split at the time of, uh, Sol right after, immediately after Solomon. Um, but you're going to see some dichotomy between the north, uh, the kingdom of Israel, and the south, the kingdom of Judah. Um, the book is sort of, historically at least, put together as the Treasar. Uh, there's a quotation in the Gemara that at least from the time of Ben Sira, so a couple hundred years before uh, the early Mishnaic portion or period in Jewish history, obviously a couple hundred years after these books would be written, it had already become known as the Treasar, and these 12 prophets are put together into a single book. The Gemara in Baba Batra asks, uh, discusses how the book came to be, and a notion that it has a very old designation. The books are connected not as much chron chronologically, as we said, they span about 300 years, but really discuss things partly thematically. And we're going to begin the discussion of those themes tonight. Um, OK. Uh, can anybody recognize this? Or if I can have a volunteer quickly come up and read the quotation, if you can read it. Didn't quite come out as dark as I wanted. Uh, I'm looking. Until justice rolls down like waters and righteousness like a mighty stream. So where does that quotation come from? Oh, oh. It's from It's uh, Montgomery, Alabama. So um, notice that the attribution on that quotation is Martin Luther King. <laughs> Martin Luther King was very, very well aware that he was paraphrasing the biblical verse that comes from Amos. He, he knew it. I don't think everybody who heard him understood it. He certainly knew it. 
and he knew what he was doing, and he did it intentionally. Maybe not like the recent movie in order to rewrite history, but at least I would argue he certainly knew about it. Um, but I just did want to show you. Okay. Yes. So. Yeah, I'm sure. And if I could just say, it was, uh, it was designed by, the, I believe, by the same woman that, yeah, okay. <laughs> it's good. Next, next month you'll be up teaching. Um, but it is, um, there actually is another use of that quotation at his graveside, which is also uh, a memorial as well. Um, but Maya Lin, while a student, designed the Vietnam Memorial Wall. She was the designer of the Civil Rights Memorial, which is where that was from. This memorial honors those who died during the Civil Rights Movement. If you looked at that opening, the circle in front, it's actually inscribed with the names of people who died in the struggle for civil rights um, and serves as a vehicle for education and reflection about the struggle for equality. The circular black granite table records the names of the martyrs and chronicles the history of the movement in lines that radiate like the hands of a clock. Water emerges from the table's center and flows evenly across the top. On a curved black granite wall behind the table is engraved Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s well-known paraphrase of uh, Amos 527, we will not be satisfied. Uh, that part is not actually in the quote. But then it says, let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like a mighty stream. And we'll return to that. And I wanted to open there because that's a pretty important theme of what we're going to talk about tonight. Um, so I wanted to give you at least a little context of the impact of the book of Amos. Uh, and most people who are aware of Dr. King's speeches don't often understand fully all the biblical references. I apologize, the map is not quite as sharp as I would like it to be, so maybe I'll misfocus and it'll be better. Um, but what I really wanted to point out are a couple key features of the biblical period. The first of which is the northern kingdom of Israel. If you notice, it crosses both sides of the Jordan River. If you remember your Torah history, you'll know that the tribes of Reuven, God, and half of Manasseh take their inheritance up here. Um, the southern kingdom stretches from Jerusalem at its northern end all the way down uh, to Beersheba and Kadesh Barnea. But I want to also point out, because it's going to be relevant for the beginning of the book, at least the surrounding nations of Egypt, Edom, Moab, Ammon, uh, and Tyre, you can see all the way up at the north. Ashur is what would be Syria. They're going to play a part in the beginning of the narrative. The only other thing that I wanted to point out along the map is this little spot, a little south of Jerusalem, called Tekoa. And <clears throat> at least according to the best information we have, it seems that Amos actually comes from Tekoa you will see that there is uh, an interplay between some of the important figures in the north uh, and uh, Amos related to the fact that he is not from the northern kingdom yet coming to prophesy to them. Um, the other things to note, um, that in the north there are particular idolatrous centers, including Bethel and up by Don, that will be part of what speaks to it. Okay. Excellent. Thank you. Um, we'll have to put that dot on the map. Um, okay. There is not a whole lot known about Amos as an individual. The book itself contains two references, and I've quoted them, one the opening verse once in chapter 7, and essentially... It doesn't provide us a whole lot of information, almost nothing about his personal life, and really only a little bit about his occupation. If you want a Tanakh, there's uh, at least a 
safer. There's one there. It's unfortunately all in Hebrew. Uh, for most of the things, I paraphrased what I wanted, and they'll appear on the slides. So if you don't really want to follow along in that detail, you don't have to. Um, so the first is the opening words, the words of Amos, one of the herders of Tekoa, who had a vision about Israel, and maybe particularly the northern kingdom, in the days of Uzziah, uh, king of Judah, and in the days of Jeroboam, the son of Yoash, who was king of Israel, the northern kingdom. And it's listed, oddly enough, in the beginning of the book as two years before the earthquake. Um, the earthquake is referenced a couple of places in the Tanakh and clearly had a huge impact on the land, uh, so much so that they begin to use a dating system based upon it. Oddly enough, you get the impression that the words were written down after the earthquake, but the words were given to Amos sometime prior to that. Okay? So it tells us he was a herder. His response in chapter 7, and we'll look at the dialogue in a little bit, what happens is he makes a prophecy about the king Jeroboam. It's not received favorably by uh, one of the idolatrous high priests who are clearly part of the power structure in the northern kingdom. Um, and Amos replied and said to Amatia, the priest of Bethel, the ancient for the king Jeroboam, the parentheses obviously are mine and not in the text when we look at it, who suggested that Amos flee south to Judah to prophesy because they weren't being particularly well received up north, at least by the powers that be. And he responded by saying, I am not a prophet, nor am I the son of a prophet, but I'm a cattle herder and an examiner of sycamores. So some think he was a wood merchant, tree cutter, I don't know, not really clear. Um, and God took me from the flock, and God said to me, go prophesy to my people Israel. Really, all I wanted to do as the basic uh, outline for what we're going to study, we're going to spend most of our time tonight looking at the actual contents of the book. The book is about nine chapters. Obviously, we couldn't read through it all tonight, and I don't intend to, but maybe next time we'll read ahead. Um, and what I really wanted to begin to do is look at the structure of the series of prophecies that appear in the book. The first structure has an interesting uh, pattern to it. And I'm more interested in the pattern than the technical aspects related to each people. So here's what I want to do simply. Um, Thus says God, for three transgressions of Damascus, so we're talking about Damascus. If you looked at our map, it was up towards the direction of Syria, where Damascus is today, either a reference to the nation of Aram or Ashur. Um, and it begins... For three transgressions of Damascus I have looked away, but for four I will not pardon them. And then they list them, for they're threshing the Gilad with rods of iron, and it doesn't list the other two or three. I will send fire into the house of Hazael, and it will consume the palaces of Ben-Hadad, both of whom are kings of Aram. I will break the bolt of Damascus, and I will eliminate inhabitants from Bikat Aven, and the one who holds the scepter from Beit Aden and the nation of Aram will be exiled to Kir, thus says God. A very brief, for three transgressions, God has withheld punishment. For the fourth transgression, God will exact punishment. And he gives you a little lay into what that punishment is. And now if you look, the pattern continues. So in verse 6, it says, for three transgressions of Gaza, I have looked away. Gaza is a reference to the Plish team who lived along the coast. Um, and, but for four, I will not pardon them. Go down to verse 9. Thus says God, for three transgressions of Tyre, I have looked away. Tyre was up in the border by Lebanon. But for four, I will not pardon them. Verse 11, for three transgressions of Edom. Verse 13, for three, three transgressions of the children of Ammon. 
Uh, next chapter, um, verse 1, for three transgressions of Moab. So the opening chapter in fraction is basically a prophecy that God will punish the surrounding nations uh, around Israel for their offenses, mostly against the Jewish people. Some are referenced to be cruel acts that they've done outside of their context to the Jewish people. So things are going great. Well, maybe not. But, so if you're an Israelite hearing that, sounds pretty good. But, as soon as we go a little further, it says in verse 3, uh, 4, verse 4, Ko amar Hashem al shosha pishe Yehuda bel arba'a lo ashivenu. Again, I'll let three transgressions of Judah, the southern kingdom, slide. But for the fourth, I won't. Um, the specific transgression referenced for the Jewish people, or the people of Judah, is for despising the Torah of God and not keeping his laws. They were corrupted by the lies that their fathers followed. Different Meforshim parse this verse differently to ask what was the specific sin, at least the latter phrase, uh, they were corrupted by the lies that their fathers followed, is a reference, some say, to false prophets whom they listened to. But in general, it's a pretty direct accusation of their failure to follow the laws in the Torah. And it says at its conclusion, I will send a fire against Yehuda and a fire against the palaces of Jerusalem. So the question was, does it say which laws have been violated? I'm going to repeat the questions just so they make sure they get on. And Bruce has given me specific instructions, so everybody give me a little round of applause. I'm at least following the instructions. Very good. Um, and the answer is no. Uh, this is all it actually says. As we go through the book, there are going to be a lot more specific details about types of sins that are committed, but they're much more generic rather than specific um, in that way. And then um, <coughs> after uh, Judah gets its tongue lashing, then we have a little more detail given to the kingdom of Israel in the north. Um, and it sort of has a variety of things that are generic because you can't actually identify either a specific event or a specific sin that's being associated. So at the end of chapter 2, this listing comes down, and I haven't taken them 100%. I just sort of took them in some order that they appear. And we might just want to briefly sort of talk about it. Selling the righteous for silver and the poor man for shoes, which someone should have an instant biblical connection to. Joseph. So, interestingly enough, uh, I looked at briefly at the commentary, didn't specifically make that connection. Many of you are aware of the Midrash that Joseph is sold for 20 pieces of silver and the brothers buy shoes with it, um, which is a very interesting accusation coming to the tribes of the north, right? The tribes of the north are essentially Ephraim is the main tribe of the north, half of the tribe of Manasseh is there. And in one way, I would expect that the language of the prophet really rang against their ears very quickly, making that connection. Um, some of the other things that are listed are sort of walking on the heads of the poor, sort of trampling over the poor, and the rich in society were taking unfair advantage of them. We'll see that theme. But what I really want to point out is all these themes are much more related to social justice than they are to failure to keep the holidays, failure to keep Shabbat, that general list as well. Twisting the judgment of the humble. Uh, father and son have relations with the same woman, a no-no in the Torah. Um, reclining on garments, meaning sort of leading a relaxing life, they have taken from the part as part of unfair lending practices. There it's specifically connected to the drinking of idolatrous wine. One of the things to point out is that when the northern kingdom separated, 
one of the bases for the separation was that the kings of the north felt second class if they would go to the temple south in Jerusalem in the kingdom of Judah. So Jeroboam ben Nevat, the first king of the north, prohibits people from coming south to Jerusalem and sets up idols in the northern kingdom. So drinking wine of idolatry and the, with money taken unjustly, not appreciating how God had helped them. There's a brief little historical um, allusion. Uh, if you look at verse 10, where it's or not a brief, a very direct reference, where it says, I brought you up out of the land of Egypt, and I led you through the wilderness for 40 years. So you get a sense of the people being uh, not very grateful for what God has done, and in particular by turning to idols, um, misleading those who want to be loyal to God. There's a passage, if you look at it, in verse 12, the Tashku et Hanizurim Yain. Not only didn't they want to be pious themselves, but they made a point of making sure that the people who wanted to be pious couldn't be pious. The Al Hanivim, Tzivitem, Lemor, Lo, Tinavu. And when the prophets said, uh, had their message, the people said, no, thank you. Better we don't hear it. Uh, than we do. So that was silencing the prophets whom God had sent. Um, and for this and more, there will be punishment. Um, and we're going to see, as the book continues, that... Yep? Do they have the same uh, theme of for three of these sins, I'll look the other way, and for the fourth, I'll, like, fourth time, I'll punish you? Nope. That pattern is ended uh, after the opening sequence. And by the way, even for Israel, it doesn't use that number specifically. Um, the one thing I did want to point out, uh, as I was studying with Rabbi Joseph, we were studying Hilcho Tshuva, and one of the things we came across was Rambam discussing that Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur are also days where not only individuals are judged, but nations are judged, and they're judged on this basis of God willing to forgive the first three transgressions, but no more. It works differently with an individual, uh, and I direct you to Rambam there. Okay. In chapter four, uh, so you see a continuing theme of that um, in terms of how God had treated the Jews special in chapter three. There are some interesting images, uh, one of which is sort of my favorite. There's an image of a lion capturing prey, and the shepherd is able to take basically a leg or an ear out, but the lion gets everything else. So uh, the lion's share, absolutely. So I wanted to look for a moment at uh, chapter 4 um, and just kind of list through the methods in which God has tried to warn the people. It's a very interesting chronology. Um, Unfortunately, I would suggest that the opening line rings very different for our ears. Um, and it begins with something you may, an expression you may have heard. Shimu hadavar hazeh parot habashan. Uh, hear this word, you cows of Bashan. And what makes it sort of ring, so Bashan was uh, the area on the, northeastern side of the Jordan River and Yam Kinneret, noted for its cattle grazing. Um, so Parot Bashan were very fatted cattle, uh, and in particular fatted cows. What makes it ring so difficult for my ears is the context of that is that the women of the northern kingdom were uh, excessive in their use of luxury, and it's a criticism of that. So we would never really use the term Parot Bashan to describe women today, not, not politically correct. But I wanted to point that out. Um, okay, uh, so I wanted to sort of list, and basically I'm looking at most of chapter four uh, as the warnings that God has given to the uh, people in the past that they have not heeded. So 
you may sort of look at God taking the environment and things that have happened as a warning for God's notion of trying to get the people to repent. So I'm not going to give you each citation. You know, uh, if you've been attending the shir between Mincha and Marv after Shabbat or after Shacharit in the morning, we have talked about the idea that fasting is a response to famine because famine is a measure of God's direct uh, happiness or unhappiness at the, un at the Jewish people. So I had alluded to it in early American history. If you go back to the time of the pilgrims and uh, Cotton Mather, you'll see a number of speeches when things don't go well for the new colonists. They declare a public fast day. So if you read the second paragraph of the Shema, you see a direct link between doing the right thing and receiving rain. So famine and lack of rain is viewed certainly by the Navi as a direct implication of God's uh, anger at the people. So it begins with the example of uh, famine. It moves on to a lack of rain. And it actually mentions that in one out of every three places there was rain and people had to travel to get water. And they didn't realize that this was a measure of punishment. If you travel to have to get water and God isn't providing it, you need to think about that and change your ways. Traditionally, you know uh, in Pirkei Avot, it's listed directly where it says these are specific times of famine uh, in the fourth year, in the seventh year, because you don't take the proper gifts for the poor. You don't give Maser Ani. Uh, so there's a direct link between uh, tragedy to crops, destruction of crops, locusts, things like that, diseases. Specifically, it mentions, um, I have sent you pestilence on the way to Egypt. So you get this idea, kind of invoking the plague imagery as punishment. And then disasters such as befell Sodom and Amorah. Their losses in battle, your children have died, you've lost your military equipment, your horses, and yet you haven't responded. Uh, and then the antidote given in the beginning of chapter 5 is to seek God in the correct place, to change your ways. And then we have our famous quotation in verse 24, Vayigal kamayi mishpat. Um, it's interesting. Uh, the translation here is, rather as implied, let justice be revealed like water. I don't think it's the correct translation. I think gal from, uh, like gal galim, wheels, that, or gal is a wave. Uh, I think that's the better translation, particularly when you look at the, uh, the second half of the parallelism, utztaka kenachal etan, and righteousness like a mighty river. Um, but I think really um, Dr. King was well aware of the context of the quotation and the notion that there are moral failings on the part of the people and there are consequences for those moral failings. And essentially, that's what is being looked at here. Uh, and at the end, it promises, I will exile you beyond Damascus, uh, said God. Hashem, tzvaot, Hashem elokei tzvaot shemo. And that really is the part of the bulk of the prophecy against the northern kingdom. But he's prophesying in the northern kingdom. And there is... A, uh, a further rebuke of the Jewish people. Um, and in some ways, what would happen in the period and a little later kind of misleads particularly the North and ultimately the South as well. And that is, the Northern Kingdom has survived a number of attempts to conquer it. Um, and as a result, the people sort of feel that Yes, God is willing to punish those other nations, but not us. Um, which is why I think this par the structure set up in the first chapter is important. The people are kind of listening, going, yeah, God will punish them, 
And only then do they actually hear the words of their punishment. Um, here we go. So in the punishment, I want to just sort of cover a couple of the consequences. But it begins with a notion that says, uh, chapter 6, verse 1, Woe to the serene people in Zion and the secure people in uh, Har Shabotim Bahar Shomron, which is in the Mount of Samaria, Shomron being the reference to the north, Yehuda being the reference to the south. So even though it seems the prophecy is primarily going to be directed at the north, there is a subtle dig at the south that they too need to change their ways. Um, and it continues. So why are they called serene people in Zion? They're confident. They don't think anything will happen. The same is true of the people in the north as well. And then he gives you the challenge. Cross over to Calne and see, I'm in verse 2, chapter 6, and go from there to great Hamat and descend to Gat of the Philistines. Are they better than these kingdoms? In other words, why do you think you're superior to them? They have as much military might as you, and if punishment befalls them, it will also come back upon you as well. Woe to you who spurn the day of evil while you convene sessions of injustice. You lie on ivory couches. You're smug in your wealth, uh, eating the fattened sheep of the flock and calves in, from inside the stall, who sing along to the tune, considering themselves like David. They drink their wine. They anoint themselves. So you have a whole litany of criticism of the wealth of the northern kingdom and how they use it. Therefore, they will now be exiled at the head of the exiles and the banquets of the haughty will cease. God says, I'm done here. Um, and it continues, uh, I loathe the glory of Jacob. Uh, I detest his palaces and I will deliver the city and its inhabitants. Um, if it happens that even if 10 men remain in one house, they will all die. And those who escape from the burning house will run into the street uh, and they'll say, is anybody left? No. So only a small remnant will remain. Uh, for behold, God commands, he will shatter the large house into fragments and the small houses into chips. Uh, How long before the actual um, destruction of the first temple and exile? So it's really a reference to, it's probably about... 250 or so years prior to even the destruction of the temple and probably about 100 years prior or maybe 70 years prior to the final exile of the northern kingdom. So is Amos standing on the corner and talking to people passing by and thinking he's crazy? My guess is he's probably standing in a fairly public place. Um, and so much so that to a certain degree, he's going to get the attention of the authorities uh, from where he's standing. Um, so either his reputation in part precedes him, or he's doing it in a public enough way. It doesn't really ever give us a specific notion, although it may be, if you remember the map, he's probably gone from the southern kingdom a little way into the northern kingdom, probably to Bethel because the king doesn't respond directly, but the priest does. And um, as another reason, obviously, as the seat of idolatry, it's probably one of the more appropriate places to speak from. But in general, there's a lot of criticism of the wealth of the northern kingdom and the way they misuse it. Yeah, you can be like the guy in Nicholas Mall talking and stuff that we all laughed at when we go by. Seriously. My guess is, since the mayor hasn't stopped off to listen? Probably not at that level. In other words, here, pretty important people in the north are going to actually hear this voice and understand where it's coming from and what the message is. So they do believe him. Uh, people are paying attention. People are paying attention. Right. And that sort of leads me back to, interestingly, one of the, um, one of the other uh, kinds of ideas, and that is, if you read the Bible, there are hundreds of prophets. 
So one of the rabbinic commentaries about why these prophets remain and are written down is because they have implication for future behavior. They're not just within their time frame, they're also beyond their time frame. But there's got to be 10 of them, 20 of them, 100 of them. Right. That are doing these things. Well, or periodically. I mean, at a certain point, he has a certain status that's sort of well known, right? Because they're afraid, you know, they don't just pull him off the street and kill him. Yeah. There's a certain degree, and Jews have been known to do that too, but, uh, but at least he must have some status that's fairly well recognized uh, as they do this, okay? Um, so uh, just sort of to come through, um, where it says God will bring armies to Israel by fire. Um, let me just read off the rest of my list. Um, your sacrifices are empty if not accompanied by good deeds. The kingdom of Judah should be sympathetic. There's a criticism that the people in Judah are looking at the north going, ah, Amos is talking to them. It's their problem. And they don't have any, a whole lot of sympathy for the north. The battles between the north and south are both sort of political, but they're also military. They're periodic wars between them um, in relation to alliances and all sorts of things. Um, chapter 7 has as part of it um, a notion that God showed Amos a punishment. Amos prays and God relents of that punishment. It happens twice, and then the third time, God gives him a vision. God doesn't give him the opportunity to pray, and he asks, what is it that you see? Uh, and we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, so the first one, and I'm on chapter 7, and these two examples basically run from chapter 7, verse 1 through verse 6. In the first one... Um, God shows him a vision of locusts coming to eat all the crops. Amos prays and God relents. There's a vision of a fire that comes. Amos prays and God relents. And now we have the third one, uh, and it is a plumb line, uh, a way for measuring the straightness of things. So the plumb line, uh, and I'm looking at... Um, it says Nitzav, um, and there are a couple things to know. Uh, so first of all, plumb line is used to measure things to make them straight. And fundamentally then, the analogy is to uh, straightness in moral behavior, uh, which is why the plumb line appears numerous times throughout the Nevi'im as a symbol. It also does something else. If the Hebrew for the word plumb line is, um, an, uh, it is an anach, um, and it has a connection of moral rectitude. If you think about the word nachon, what is correct, it's a symbol for correct behavior. Uh, and you'll see this play on words in a different context but they're meant and designed specifically to be plays on words as well. Um, but God does say, I've for, sort of for, uh, held off my punishment. I'm not going to bring plague one and plague two, but I will bring the third thing. And in specific, if you look at um, verse 9, the high places of Isaac will be made desolate, and the sanctuaries of Israel destroyed, and I will rise up against the house of Jeroboam with the sword, saying he's going to overthrow the current king of the northern kingdom. Um, now, that sets up in part the conflict of king and prophet. It's a continuing theme in the books of the Nevi'im, in the prophets. It happens, you find... Jeremiah thrown into jail, you find Zechariah thrown into, you'll find it quite frequently, but there's always, you've seen it with Elijah and Ahav, a theme of a direct conflict between um, the 
prophet and the king. The prophet now speaks on behalf of God. So, uh, basically having just uttered the prophecy that Jeroboam is going to be killed, Amatia in chapter 7 verse 10 says, who's the priest of Bethel, we met him in the opening uh, slide or two that gave you a brief bio biographical information of Amos. And he said, Amos has conspired against you in the midst of the house of Israel. The land cannot tolerate all his words. For thus did Amos say, Jeroboam will die by the sword and Israel will be exiled from upon its land. Notice that all the other words of prophecy about misdeeds and bad behavior get skipped over. <laughs> Amatsia's only concern may be his political standing, uh, and as the priest at Bethel, really the central place of idolatrous worship in the north, he goes to respond. Uh, Amatsia then says, Seer, go flee to the land of Judah, eat bread there that you may prophesy. So, in part, that's at least using the example of Tekoa, we locate it on the map. There's an indication that Amos is a prophet from outside of the northern kingdom. And, you know, as a carpetbagger, or the opposite of a carpetbagger, it's not going over well. His message is not being well received. Um, and then there's another implication, and that is, eat bread there in Judah that you may prophesy. There's a notion that he's doing it for money that basically he's being paid by the South to prophesy against the North. None of this is true. It's irrelevant. Uh, and therefore, that implication is there. That's why he responds by saying, I don't need the money. Believe me, I could do without the headache. God sent me here. Uh, he responds by saying, Lo navi anochi, I am not a prophet. Velo ben navi anochi, I am not the son of a prophet. Kivo keranochi, I'm a cattle herder. Uvole shikmaim, I am a sycamore appraiser. Whether they were trees or wood, or uh, he's the uh, warehouser of his generation, I don't know. Uh, it doesn't really tell you. And then it basically says, God took me from following the sheep, and he said, go prophesy to my people Israel. Uh, and now listen to the word of God. Uh, you who say, do not prophesy against Israel, um, and you who say, uh, don't preach to the house of Isaac, therefore, God says, in particular to Jeroboam, your wife will be promiscuous in the city and your sons and daughters will fall by the sword and your land will be divided up by lot and you will die on contaminated soil and Israel will be exiled from its land. He sort of says, okay, I've come, I've done, I'm heading out. Um, there's another vision and in some ways that uh, ends most of sort of part of the narrative, but there's another vision that he's going to have um, the second portion of which uh, is a Haftorah that begins, we read it for Achare Mot. But I wanted to look a little at chapter 8. We had mentioned before the imagery of how the dream, how the vision has an item. We used the plumb line before. We now use another one. Uh, in the beginning of chapter 8, God showed me a basket of summer fruits. Summer in Hebrew is... Kites, connected to the word kates, meaning the end. So basically he's going to use it as a prophecy of the destruction. Um, let me see where I did it. So here's the final, the prophecy of a final destruction. And that is, um, and it's not specifically directed to the north. It's also directed to the south as well. And here you have a list of uh, specific transgressions. I didn't quote them here. They're slightly different than what we saw before. Decimating the poor, uh, selling grain, not waiting for the new grain, the sabbatical year, uh, so they kind of manipulate the prices and the product to extract more money from the poor, to purchase the poor with silver, uh, distort using dishonest scales, Right now I'm on chapter 8, verses 5 in that area. 
Uh, God has sworn by Jacob, I will never forget their deeds. The land will quake and they'll be flooding in the land. And then it says um, on verse 9, and it shall be on that day the word of the God of Elohim that I will bring down the sun at midday. I will darken the land on a day of light. I will turn your festivals into mourning and all your songs into lamentation. And I will bring sackcloth upon all loins and baldness upon every head. And I will make the land as if in mourning for an only child and its end will be like a bitter day. So that's the vision of destruction. Fortunately, we're going to get a little bit back uh, of consolation in chapter 9. Um, and in particular, it continues that the temple too will be destroyed and the people will go into exile. <laughs> Within the prophecy of destruction is the following verse. Um, Behold, days are coming, says the Lord, and I will send a hunger in the land. It will not be a hunger for bread nor a thirst for water, but a hunger and a thirst to hear the words of God. So one of the things I wanted to do, uh, I will give a plug to Camp Ma. They have uh, a number of CDs, one of which has Sudashli Sheet songs on it. And this is one of them. So listen to the words. They're printed for you. Whoops. Help. <coughs> That's not supposed to happen. That hoodie? Uh, here, okay. Oh. oh, sorry about that. Um, there's another version of it. Um, and I'm not gonna, I didn't play all of that one. I won't play all of this one, but. Um, so, if you notice, that message seems to be a very positive one. People will seek out God, but what they don't quote is the next portion of the verse that says, but they won't find God. <laughs> um, it's a very classic rabbinic reading of text where you parse it out so it works the way you need it to work out. Um, that's why I put the oops there. We'll find God, but we, I mean, we'll search for God, but we won't find it. Chapter 9 as I had mentioned before, the last chapter in the book has a reference. Um, it begins with the famous phrase, or not the beginning of the chapter. The Haftarah begins at verse 7, and it's, Halo kivnei kushiim atemli. Behold, aren't you like the children of Ethiopia to me? And if you read uh, the commentary uh, when it appears for Mot, you'll often say, kushiim. Um, and I would actually argue that its intent here is actually black is beautiful. Uh, the Ethiopians are black. Um, they're in particular, it's a reference to their sort of uniqueness and special quality 
uh, as being beautiful, um, but there are other commentaries that might look askance at that interpretation. Um, but what I really wanted to do is focus just for a moment that the final prophecy is a positive one, and the book ends on a note of hope. And that is, if you go down to, um, so verses 7 through 10, basically talk about the process of exile as being a removal of sinners from the congregation, and a pure body will remain. So that the process of exile accomplishes something in relation to spiritually purifying the people. And uh, you'll find a very familiar phrase when you begin verse 11, and that is, Bayom hahu akim et sukat David hano falet or no felet, depending upon your grammar, which we use in Birkat HaMazon as the prayer for the restoration of the temple uh, on Sukkot, because it's called Sukkot David, the Sukkah of David. Um, and God will repair the breaches and the walls and build up the city and the temple as in days of old. And the, uh, those who call my name will inherit the remnant of Edom, and all the nations will hear the word of God. And then it begins in a very similar pattern to the phrase that opened the song. Hine yamim ba'im, behold days are coming, Neum Hashem says God, when the plowman will meet the reaper and the treader of grapes, the one who carries the seed. If you know your uh, text from Devarim, there's a passage in Devarim talking about the blessing where it says that there'll be almost a continuous cycle you'll harvest until it's time to plant. You'll have such an abundance of grain that the seasons will kind of run into each other. You won't need to wait for the new harvest. You'll have that abundance. Um, and that's part of what this is about. And then it says, V'shavti et shvut ami Yisrael, I will bring back the remnant of my people, Israel, Uvanu Arim, and I will build cities, um, Nishamot, uh, the famous city is Vyashuvu, and they will settle them. Vinatnu Kramim, they'll plant vineyards. Vyashatu et Yenam, they will drink the wine. Vyasuganot, they'll make gardens. Vyachlu et Pirehem, and they'll eat the fruits. Unitatim al Admatam, they will plant on the land. Lo Yinatushu od me al Admatam, they will never again be uprooted from the land. That I have given them, Amar Hashem Elokecha. And the book ends on a positive note of prophecy about the return and restoration of the Jewish people. Um, thoughts, questions, comments, things you want me to address that I didn't? How did the structure work for you? How did the audio visuals work? Yes. So, in my mind, my, uh, you know, Kings finds about all the kings and all the things that are going on, both in the morning and in the And all the prophets, for the most part, follow the same general format. They go to the people, they talk to the people, and they listen, blah, blah, blah. So, what makes Amos stand out? What, what, What's the telltale thing about Amos that makes it more than the other tribes? A fair question. Um, I think more than anything else, the proportion of Haftarot to book size is actually exceptionally large. Um, so that there are a number of imageries which seem to be enduring for that. Um, and in particular, um, so I think that's one thing. I think you're right. It fits within a general pattern. <coughs> and there really isn't all that much sort of unique other than a little of the language. Uh, and in particular, I guess, a timing phrase in that he seems to be relatively early in the cycle um, compared to some of the others. Uh, and that is at least a willingness to sort of directly confront. But you're right primarily other than certain of his language and imagery that carries out and endures beyond him. But I think the message is very similar and very parallel. So I, I may have no idea, but is it is he more emphasizing 
I don't know that I would say more. I think it's clearly an emphasis. I would say there is a significant downplaying of the failure to observe Shabbat and holidays in that way. But I think uh, it is, if I were to make the argument, I'd say it's almost 90-10 that it really talks about the moral failing of the people. Um, and in many ways, is only tangentially directed directly at the leadership of the people. It's not an accusation uh, until Matsu responds. It seems as if he's standing on the street corner talking broadly uh, to people in that regard. I just wanted to share one um, note and see if this didn't mess me up. Okay, hang on one second. Uh, I wanted to share with you, I won't be here Sunday, I have a previous commitment, but um, I wanted to um, see if I can track it down. Uh, I sent a set of questions. We're not quite sure. Uh, Judy's going to have a dialogue with the Berman Shul tomorrow just to check the technology, among other things, but also to uh, talk about the structure of the joint meeting. And I just wanted to um, see if this is where I put it. Um, so some of the things that we might talk about, and you might want to think about, how do each of our communities use our encounters with the text to shape shul social action programs and activities? Does anything in American or Israeli culture make the source material appropriate to use in determining national public policy? That's what the King quote was really designed to do. It opened a whole dialogue about public policy. How should such values be used in the political dialogue in Israel and America as we think about our elections and their recent elections? How does the vision of a restored people to its land impact our understanding of Zionism and is the promise of a restored temple relevant to current politics in Israel in the relation to the Palestinians or the direction of the national religious parties can we discern God's hands in international affairs with or out, without the direct prophetic message or whether we have anyone who is accepted to speak in God's name? And finally, how do we as individuals respond to the call of the prophet? So I've sent that list of questions on. Judy will talk about this tomorrow. Uh, Joshua Klein, who emailed me back uh, after, their, after Rabbi Lau's lecture, said, uh, he alluded to some of those topics, so they at least might be aware of them. So, any other thoughts, questions, comments? Thank you all for attending. Thank you.